Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter, and as usual, it's Friday, and State Senator Mark Mesmer joins us in the studio, and this time we're going to talk about some bills that Mark has been working on or that have been coming out of your mm -hmm. committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's go right to it, because there's a, a lot of things that are going on. Oh yeah, it's, it was a very busy week at the State House. I mean, the, the first couple weeks, getting committees up to speed, it was a little slow. We did about another 25 bills on the floor this week. We did 25 the first week. We'll probably do, you know, 100 a week, you know, the next two or three weeks. I mean, it'll, it'll, I mean, we'll, it'll ramp up that much, you know, that much more of an intensity. Um, I had six bills that were heard in committee this week, two on Tuesday, two on Wednesday, and two on Thursday. And four of them moved out of committee. One's going to get amended next Tuesday, and then, and then the other one, you know, probably later in, in session. Uh, but uh, very, very productive week, very good feedback on the bills that I presented and and on uh, Tuesday um, I don't submit bills very often that go through the criminal code or the judiciary committee because it's a room full of attorneys and and <laughs> never a fun experience mm, right <laughs> uh, but uh, the bill that I the first bill I heard on Tuesday was uh, Senate bill 551 and that bill uh, wor wor the worked with the state prosecutors uh, it's, it's called the victims bill of rights basically and, and we went through a bunch of our code sections where, you know, the victim of a crime, you know, in my opinion, and, and the one that kind of drove this, you know, the start of the discussion last spring with the Prosecutor Association was my local constituent whose, whose daughter was being groomed, you know, by the parent of one of her, of her friends, uh, being, being groomed for, you know, sex abuse, you know, potential. Nothing in law to allow any intervention you know, because he hadn't actually transmitted a nude text image or he hadn't actually, you know, done, you know, a sexual molestation or whatever. I mean, no, nothing had risen to that level. The contact hadn't actually been made. Well, why on earth as a parent, you know, with a, a child you know is being groomed, why do we need to wait until somebody's been hurt mm -hmm. to, to get something in place to, to intervene? And so that was, that was part of the bill, but in the process of working with them over the spring and summer and fall, we started to piece together other issues across the state and other scenar scenarios, you know, kind of like this one, uh, you know, and whether it dealt with, you know, this would be allowing protective orders, you know, when, you know, when patterns of behavior of, of, you know, grooming by a sexual predator are starting to happen and can be verified to give parents the ability to, to file a protective order in that scenario. And then, if any other contact is made, then there's then then it elevates to something, you know, criminal that a prosecutor can can dig in on. Uh, but along with that, <clears throat> we had other other sections dealing with. There's there's actually um, three different places in in law where if a person thinks a child is 14 and they're actually only 13, there's crimes that kick in for somebody who's, you know, 12 or 13, you know, 13 and under, and there's ones that kick in from whether the 14 to 16, and, and, and there's, there's loopholes in, in, our, in our law that if, it, if somebody thought they were 14 and they were only 13, their defense could be, well, I wasn't, vic I wasn't guilty of the crime that you're charging me because she was actually only 13, but because I thought she was 14, I'm not guilty of, of the crime that I actually committed. So it's a very ab absurd loophole. So there's several sections, you know, in our law that we're going to do a cleanup amendment that gets rid of that loophole. That I mean, ultimately, you can't use misunderstanding of their age as a defense. Um, and then there was other section in code where, and we'll probably, you know, need to work on, you know, this amendment. But if you have a, a child who's been a sex, sex abuse victim, you know, requiring them to go through a, a, a deposition you know, with the defense attorney and, and your, and your, you know, the person you're accusing, you know, in a deposition process can be traumatizing to a kid. They already have to go through a, a forensic, you know, interview. Uh, there's a group here in Jasper that does that for about Swy a six, yep, 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 does that for about a six county region. You know, that information is recorded. It's part of the criminal record that has to be used to, you know, to go to the prosecutor to, you know, to start the, you know, the sex abuse, you know, criminal charges. Uh, no federal statutes, you know, I mean, actually you're prohibited from, you know, in a, in a in federal case of, you know, having that victim be deposed, you know, by the, by the defense attorney. 
and most other states don't have the kind of, you know, deposition process that we have, you know, for sex abuse victims, and, and it's excluded in many states. But it's a, it's a it's an area we've never impeded on, you know, at at the trial court level, you know, in Indiana. But it, I mean, so that one we may need to to do some additional work on on that specific amendment. But the uh, the other parts of the bill, there was really no opposition in committee. The deposition one kind of got a few of the attorneys, Democrat and Republican, concerned about you know the legislative body, you know, telling the judicial you know branch how to do their job. Um, but we're we're gonna we're gonna push the envelope a little bit on that, and because it's really in, in you know when we're looking at who do we need to try to protect. I mean, I think we need to try to do a better job of protecting victims. Mm -hmm. So, a few other cleanups throughout code, but uh, really that, that ball got rolling from a call from a person right here at home, and that, that's how it happens a lot. Uh, also on Tuesday, uh, we had a, uh, um, a bill in um, health committee, and it, it, it's dealing with the Southeast Trans. I don't know if um, any people around here who use uh, Medicaid non-emergency medical transports, the state has contracted with a group out of Georgia to, to administer, you know, the, the customers calling in, you know, scheduling a pickup, um, and then picking them up and taking them to the doctor's appointment and then bringing them back home. Um, and as a, as a whole across the state, I mean, it might be working really well in Marion County, but it ain't working very well anywhere else. I mean, it's a miserable failure across the state. And so uh, Senate Bill um, 480 that I'm a, an author of, we had a hearing, we brought in Southeast Trans, you know, we had, you know, we, we grilled them pretty hard for about two hours and it, it was not a pleasant day for, you know, the FSSA who administers that program and Southeast Trans who, who they've contracted, to, you know, to do the, do the dispatching for the state. Uh, the pro, I mean, it, the problem with the, the process is when they, when Southeast Trans took over, you would have thought before they rolled it out, they would have had providers identified in all 92 counties. They had none prearranged. Uh, my first calls that I got were from Memorial Hospital. They, they use their ambulance service to go to the nursing homes. You know, when they, I mean, they have, when, they, when they have ambulances available, they weren't on calls and they would pick up nursing home patients, bring them to the hospital, get their treatments, take them back. I mean, in, in, in Du Bois County and in most rural you know, counties, pretty well everybody had something that was working and working well. Um, but this, you know, Southeast Trans, um, it, was, it was just a, a poor rollout. In, in, in concept, if they'd have had it worked on and mapped out for a year before they rolled it out, they probably could have done a, a decent job. So the Senate Bill 480, requires them on their website to list in every county how many drivers and how many vehicles they've got available in every county uh, for non-emergency transportation. And to post in every county how many times they've failed, where they've, they've, they've canceled a pickup, sometimes minutes before they're supposed to get the, the patient and take them. Uh, and I've had, in six months, seven, eight months that this has been rolled out, I mean, I've, I have a, had hundreds, if not into the thousands, of, of customers in, in my district in Southwest Indiana that have had, just they've just failed to show up, mm -hmm. or they canceled at the last minute. Uh, Representative Bacon in Warwick County uh, had a patient not picked up for a dialysis appointment, and that patient died. So, I mean, it's a pretty significant mm -hmm. problem. Uh, um, and then we're gonna have a review commission that's gonna review those statistics in all 92 counties and I, we're just we're just building the case, you know, for the governor's office to terminate this contract with Southeast Trans because it was, it's still today. Are they picking up customers in, in metropolitan areas at a more effective rate? Uh, yeah, because they're using the Yellow Cab Company in, in Marion County to to do all the pickups. They're even sending Yellow Cab two hours north, two hours south of, of Indianapolis, paying them to drive to to small towns across northern and southern Indiana from a cab company in Annapolis to do the pickups because they don't have anybody else lined up to do them. So then on Wednesday um, I had a 
bill called Unlawful Indemnity, Senate Bill 230, complicated term, but uh, in, in Indiana law for 40 years on a construction project, you had a, you know, every contractor on the project was responsible for their employees, you know, safety, if, 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 if some, one of my employees did something wrong and, and he got hurt, I was responsible for it. There was an appeals court ruling a couple years ago that in any case, if any, any employee was hurt by any subcontractor, no matter, I mean, and, and even when they were their own fault, that liability passed up to the general contractor on the job and kind of turned case law on its head. So this bill clearly resets and defines, you know, each, each contractor, you know, is, is responsible for, you know, for their people being safe on a job, for their own employees' safe behavior and, and, and unanimous support out of committee. Uh, I don't expect that bill to have any, any objection in the House or Senate. And also on Wednesday I had a, a bill in Labor Committee that uh, clearly defines in, in code what direct sales companies are. Um, my wife is a Mary Kay director. There's companies like Avon, Amway, you know, Shackley. I mean, there are all kinds of direct sales company, and just clearly defines that they are not an employee. They are, you know, a direct sales person is is never paid a salary. They're always paid on commission, or you buy the product for a dollar, you sell it for two. I mean, you know, and 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 strictly a commission paid, you know, proposition. And we went through the unemployment. Definitions and the and the workman's compensation definitions and, and put in that direct sales definition. So it clearly delineates. We've never had a lawsuit in in Indiana yet. Uh, some other states, you know, with aggressive attorneys general or whatever, you know, have had you know problems with that. Thirty thirty eight other states have laws just like this. It it we took took the federal law on direct sales definitions and copied it. You know, really verbatim to put it in the, in the Indiana Code just to clear up any problems. And then on Thursday I had two bills in Utilities Committee on uh, rural broadband issues and uh, one of them passed out unanimously, uh, Senate Bill 460, and there had been a, a, about a two-year fight between broadband companies and NDOT, Department of Transportation, on allowing broadband companies to have access to, you know, highway right-of-way just like telephone, gas, water, sewer, power. I mean, all, all the regulated utilities, and some, some utilities are public utilities, but they're not regulated utilities. But all those utility companies have access to the right-of-way to file a permit with NDOT, map out your plan, and, and NDOT has come up with their interpretation that, well, when telephone companies were telephone companies and cable companies were cable companies, you know, we considered them individual utilities and, and let them in. And now since telephone, broadband, you know, internet, cable, they're all just all kind of all the same. And so now they've decided, you know, they're not letting broadband companies in to that right away by their own interpretation of what they think our laws say. And Senate Bill 460 here again clearly delineates a, a broadband company has the same rights to access that right away as any other utility company. And, and then we put in that also because NDOT was working on a, in the interstate right away, they don't let anybody in. So if they don't let broadband companies in, they're treating them the same as everybody else, which is what we're asking for is parity. Um, but, but NDOT wants to develop a, a program uh, that, that allows them to, in those interstate corridors, if people want to if they want to contract with NDOT, you know, to get into those interstate corridors, that they have a fee, you know, to do that. And I don't think anybody has any objection to that. But the way NDOT's policy they've been trying to roll out for about a year and a half now was that they were going to put that charge on every broadband company and every right-of-way, not just the interstate right-of-ways. So uh, part of my bill was if you have existing infrastructure in the ground, they can't charge you now or in the future. If it's there, it's there. Because part of their policy was they wanted to charge you for what you already had in the ground. Doesn't work. And then allow them in the interstate right away where if they want to charge them a per mile fee to be in that right away where it might be, depending on the density of your customer base, it might make perfect sense and be cost effective to do that. But running down State Road 64 or down State Road 162, 
you know, when you're trying to pick up rural unserved customers, it doesn't make any sense. It, I mean, it takes already a very expensive uh, process of getting that broadband and, and, and doubles or more the cost of that, you know, broadband deployment. And it's, it's already too expensive to deploy. It's why they don't have it now. And making it more expensive would just be, I mean, it has made it prohibitive. So I actually worked pretty closely with NDOT on that. They, you know, they seem to be in agreement with, with giving them the interstate program they want, blocking them from everywhere else, making sure no utilities that are in the ground get charged in the future, and giving broadband companies you know, the same treatment as all of the utilities. We got it through uh, our first hurdle out of committee. It'll pass through the floor easily. Now, now I have to start working with my, my Senate sponsor on the other side, or House sponsor on the other side, to make sure it gets uh, treated well when it gets there. And then the overall broadband granting the governor's working on, we had them, I had a bill that would have made sure that they were following our House Enrolled Act 1065 we passed last year on parameters. M my bill would have probably made, you know, their current rollout um, come to a screeching halt. I, you know, that wasn't necessarily my intention. It, it was if, you know, if they weren't going to follow the, the bill we passed last year, but had them come in and do a report on where that, you know, where that granting program stands, that they're going to follow the, the guidelines we set up last year and, and how they're going to roll it out, who's going to administer it, and was pretty satisfied with what they said. But we'll, we'll still go back and look at some of the fine, you know, finer points that we felt might still need to be addressed, and we could pair that Senate Bill 461 down to address maybe a, a few bits and pieces that we feel like you know need to be clearly identified yet in, the, in their in their new policy. So to help we get broadband in a rural uh, area. Yep, 100 million dollars in into rural broadband unserved customers would make a significant dent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially for the rural areas. Yep. yep. Right. In our area, mm -hmm. where all of yeah, our viewers are. Yeah. That's all right. right. We, which is basically your district. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Uh, as always coming in on Fridays to kind of keep us up to date. And today we've run through the uh, bills that State Senator Mark Mesmer is uh, an author on or uh, somehow associated mm -hmm. with. And we look forward to having you back next week. Great. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. This has been uh, 18WJTS Inform with our guest, State Senator Mark Mesmer. Thank you for watching. We're local people watching local people.